Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, uh, I'm Len Rydell, the Executive Director of the Blue and Gray Education Society, and I'd like to welcome you to, I think, the 14th, maybe the 15th um, uh, presentation in our uh, video Zoom series that we started back uh, at the start of January. Uh, the purpose of this particular series, of course, is to uh, uh, whet your appetite uh, for the uh, resumption of our uh, seminar and uh, tour season, which uh, starts in actually next week with um, with our programs with Bob Jenkins down um, in Dalton, Georgia, followed up by uh, Greg Mertz's Shiloh program, and then we move into um, into a full and robust uh, series in uh, June, uh, constantly evolving as a result of um, of COVID uh, and, and the changes in CDC guidance and so forth. Uh, the good news is, is that generally the, um, the guidance is uh, uh, becoming a little more relaxing uh, with, uh, with more um, freedoms being uh, granted to folks that are uh, fully immunized. And I think that that's gonna allow us to get back to, to business here pretty soon. Um, uh, we certainly will still have restrictions, uh, uh, but I hope that they will begin to diminish as we get further into the season, into June and, and um, uh, July and August and so forth. Uh, this evening's program is actually my program. I, as uh, many of you who I, I know many of the folks are on here uh, who know me, uh, I'm first and foremost a historian. Uh, I I relish history. That's what got me into the blue and gray and got me going with this. And I like all elements of history. Um, uh, so over 20 gets what's, I guess, getting ready to start our 28th year in a, in a couple of weeks. Uh, we have ranged everywhere from uh, King Philip's War all the way through uh, uh, the Central Pacific Campaign in World War II. And, and then we've had a lot of um, uh, interface with uh, our soldiers through our Wounded Warrior Program. We've had a lot of interface with our soldiers and Marines and, and airmen who uh, have been wounded uh, in uh, wars uh, more recently over the last 20 years or so. So we've had a, a really good time of it. And, and um, every, every once in a while, I'll indulge myself and allow myself to lead a tour um, uh, just because I like to do it. And, and I like to pick the place I go. And uh, this program that I'm going to be leading will be uh, conducted from October 1st through the 3rd, and it will be in Concord, Massachusetts, and it's uh, Revolutionary War 101, The Coming Storm, Revolution in America. Um, uh, I'll do my administrative announcements, which will, will make it a little difficult to transition, but I'll, be, I'll transition as gracefully as I can into the start of the program after I finish my administrative uh, announcements. But uh, what I'm going to do on this one, which I have not done before, and the reason I'm doing it is because I'm the, I'm the, um, uh, the dartboard. So uh, whereas I wasn't sure how we would handle Q&A for other historians and so forth coming from an audience, I'm gonna be willing after I finish my presentation which I think is probably going to be around 40 minutes or so. Um, uh, I'll be willing then to uh, take questions from you all and we'll talk about things. And as with the others, I'll wrap up uh, somewhere around um, uh, between five minutes of nine and nine o'clock and, um, and we'll call it a night. Uh, this program is open for registration. Uh, I am seriously considering I'll, I'll be on the phone uh, soon with the folks in Concord, the, uh, there is a, um, uh, a colonial inn that is original to the times from built in 1715 that has about 56 guest rooms. And um, I'm thinking of making that the headquarters hotel. It won't be inexpensive, but we are talking about just maybe two nights, three at the most. And, and I think it would be a really neat place. It's right on the square in Concord. Uh, so um, um, the other thing I would uh, uh, like to say, um, as I have said before, uh, those of you who uh, may be not aware, um, uh, Karen Needles is our host here. Karen is the uh, director of the Lincoln Archives Project. And um, 
uh, she um, uh, has been working for more than 20 years on digitizing records out of the Lincoln archives. And, and it's really a fabulous uh, collection of what she has done. Uh, she wants to digitize all the, the records or about 11 million records in the archive. She's done probably 100,000 in 20 years. So I figure she probably only needs another 700 or 750 years to complete the project. But what she has done is really remarkable. And um, uh, if you're you're curious, make note of that and go take a look at it. And um, uh, it's got things like the uh, the trial records of the uh, the Lincoln conspirators. It has the uh, uh, the Dakota Indian Wars uh, trial records in which uh, Lincoln ordered um, 38 Indians uh, executed simultaneously right after Christmas in 1862 for the uprising in Minnesota. And um, uh, then he also acquitted or he um, or he commuted, oh, the better part of 90 percent of the of the uh, the records and uh, Karen is screening some of those things here. So it's really fascinating. It, it's eye opening. And I hope uh, that if you haven't looked, you ought to go look. Uh, sadly, many of these cases were only about five minutes long and they went to the next one. Guilty, sentenced to be hanged. But um, but you see a lot of bits and pieces in there. Well worth the effort. Uh, she is not a uh, incorporated nonprofit education group. Um, and so uh, while she certainly uh, can stand donations to help underwrite the cost and pay the electric bills and everything, uh, she, she handles most all this out of her pocket and uh, certainly welcomes uh, anybody who is willing to, um, to, to assist her with, it, with a donation. So highly commended and uh, as you can see, uh, very comprehensive, a lot of stuff there. So take a look and enjoy. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, uh, it might uh, surprise many of you that uh, tonight we're talking about the Revolutionary War. Of course, we we previously did that with um, with Gary Eckelbarger or with Scott Patchen, and then uh, we'll have another one with Gary Eckelbarger and Scott Patchen in this series. So we're doing three Revolutionary War programs this year. Uh, my program uh, is. Uh, one that is of great personal interest to me. I've done it uh, once or twice before over the past years, and uh, I just think it is really fascinating. And tonight, what I wanted to do is I wanted to uh, to give you all some insights that I'm not sure many people really think of and tie together. Of course, my specialty is a historian. I have a master's in history uh, from Old Dominion, and um my specialty is military political relations. That's what that's what spins my my buttons and so forth. And so consequently, um, uh, I try to tie all these things together. And in doing so, I find myself dealing with uh, uh, the theoretic foundations of war as a means of politics and and how it is how it uh, occurs over a period of time. And in looking at and analyzing the the wars of America that lead to the Civil War and uh, America's evolution beyond the Civil War in, into the 20th and 21st centuries, as we see different elements of, um, of, of conflict within our society and between societies of different ideologies and so forth. Uh, there's a lot to be learned from here. And I, and I think that uh, what is really unique about the uh, United States is its uh, prehistory and uh, how it influences what I think uh, was an inevitable uh, confrontation that was the American Revolution. And then subsequently uh, to that, once the Constitution and the other uh, contradictions uh, that went with this new type of a government that was put together came to the forefront and were articulated in the Constitution and in, in its various and a sundry um, uh, um, uh, amendments, I think we, we can learn a great deal about what makes America unique in and of its own right. Of course, in America, uh, the, the, uh, the first colonists um, uh, came ashore in Massachusetts about, um, about uh, uh, oh, 
10 or 11 years after the first uh, uh, colonists landed in Virginia and, uh, and came forward. And um, uh, from 1620 until the uh, Massachusetts colony was incorporated in 1630, uh, the, uh, the people, the, the, the Puritans and the, uh, the pilgrims and so forth were pretty much on their own. So much so that um, within 50 years, in, in um, uh, approximately 1675, uh, they were involved in a war for their survival, a little war for their survival. Now, we had seen things like this in American history before when uh, the first um, uh, people settled on the Outer Banks at Oak Croak Island, uh, they disappeared. The, the lost colony is, is, a, is a legend of, of America that goes back to the early 17th century. Uh, the, the settlers in Jamestown had a great deal of difficulty with the Indians that uh, lived on the Virginia Peninsula who didn't think very much of people of a different color, different race, different ethnicity uh, that were um, uh, settling in their, in their territorial lands where they made a living. Um, so too, this happened up in, in New England. Uh, once the, uh, the Puritans and the Pilgrims got settled up there, uh, they found themselves in contact with a multitude of, um, of uh, uh, Indian tribes up there of all different natures. Now, it may come as a surprise to some of you that um, just because people appear to be of the same uh, race or ethnicity does not mean that they get along. And uh, just as we have seen in every corner of the earth, um, in America, the Indians fought against each other. In the revolution, some would side with the British, some would side with the uh, colonists. Uh, in the Civil War, the same thing. Some sided with the Southerners, some with the Northerners. Some didn't want any part of either one of them. And um, as America expanded, uh, the whites didn't want anything to do with the red man. And, and so you had the Trail of Tears and, and uh, the Indian removal under Andy Jackson. So... It, it really didn't come as much surprise that after 45 or 50 years that the various and sundry Indian tribes that uh, were interfacing with the pilgrims and, and the Puritans uh, finally came to blows with them. And uh, the uh, war known to history as King Philip's War was the first of three Indian wars that took place uh, in uh, the New England region. But King Philip's War was the only one in which the British government did not get involved, did not send soldiers, didn't do anything to assist. Uh, the colonists in New England were left on their own and uh, they survived. But per capita, King Philip's War was the bloodiest conflict in American history, uh, bloodier in the Civil War, bloodier in World War II or any of the others. And we don't understand that, but the, the, uh, the Anglos living in New England came very near to being wiped out. Over 3,000 of them uh, died in that, in that war. And so consequently, uh, the, the hardy individualism that marked the, these settlements that then began to spread out from, from uh, the Cape and, and into the interior of, uh, of Massachusetts compelled these people to become self-reliant, and they did. We're talking 1620, 130 years later, by 1750, there have been three Indian wars, two of them that have been involving the primary contending forces in North America. The British are very heavily invested in North America. They've got uh, 14 colonies, uh, the 13 that you know, the Americans, and the 14th colony is Canada. Um, uh, they're making a huge investment in all this. The French also are invested in, uh, in Canada, and they've also moved along the uh, Mississippi River. Uh, they will have investments in southern Louisiana. The Spanish have a peripheral interest in what is going on. 
But centrally speaking, the conflict is between the French and the British. And uh, the dominance that Britain had shown, because Britain had developed a had developed into a world power and the strength of that world uh, dominance had come about as a result of their navy. Their navy commanded the seas of the world. Uh, they commanded the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, it had the ability to control uh, travel between areas and commerce. Many of you may remember back to your days as a child uh, where you studied pirates and privateers and stuff. Uh, the British had privateers when the Spanish got into Central and Southern America and found all sorts of wealth, silver and gold and all of that. Huge treasure ships were, were uh, brought forth to uh, bring the, uh, the treasure-laden Spanish galley, galleons uh, back to, uh, to Spain and the British um, uh, uh, pirates and privateers like Sir Francis Drake uh, invested heavily in all of this, and they and they dominated the seas along the American coast uh, before people began to cross the Atlantic in places like Bermuda and and the uh, Spice Islands in the West Indies and and the uh, uh, the uh, British. Uh, British uh, West Indies and the French West Indies all found themselves uh, competing for the wealth that was there. And with, with Britain having a solid toehold on the Atlantic coast and the timber in New England being of such extraordinary quality, uh, the relationship between Britain and New England was cemented hard. And when the, when the French elected to contest that um, along the St. Lawrence River, moving on towards the Mississippi River, the British took, took uh, issue with that and uh, conflict in Europe spread to conflict in America. And that conflict in America was the French and Indian War, which uh, started in 1754 and ended in 1763. Um, to understand the, 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 the French and Indian War, and of course we know George Washington and Braddock and, and Forbes and, and all the things that happened in the French and Indian War, what we don't full well appreciate is just how expensive that war is. I'm going to give you a perspective on that that I hope you can get your hands around. Uh, when the British went into that war uh, in 1754, they their national debt was approximately 70 million pounds. Now, 70 million pounds in today's dollars would be uh, $17 billion today. When you think about a society that um, uh, uh, was had all its wealth concentrated in inherited wealth, which the old world basically was, that kind of money was very hard to come by uh, because everybody who had money was titled and paid money to the king anyway. Well, George II uh, starts the French and Indian War, and he dies just before the end of it. And his 23-year-old son, uh, George III, ascends to the throne at the end of the war. Now, George II is a much older man um, and he has much older um, uh, advisors. Uh, George is a youngster. George has been raised in the shadow of, of his father. Uh, he has been uh, groomed to be king uh, as, he, he, as he now is. And at the time of the start of the revolution, uh, when the shooting starts, he'll just be 35 years of age. But what George inherits out of, um, out of his father's death in the end of the French and Indian War is uh, a debt that has doubled now to $34 billion. Uh, the war has cost Britain $17 billion. That's in today's money. That's a hell of a lot of money. And 
George doesn't know where that's going to come from because he's already tapped out most of his, most of his, uh, of his um, uh, um, uh, noblemen uh, that all have um, inherited titles and so forth and have land that's been assigned to them over the generations by uh, his predecessors. And so uh, his parliament looks and recommends to him that they need to start looking at their outer colonies as sources of revenue. I mean, they're already getting revenue from the trade. They've got a lot of trade going on, but now they've got millions of people living in America and they're living free. Uh, more than that, what the French and Indian War has done is it has put the British in a very awkward situation. It's put them in a box. You had the 13 colonies, but what had been happening is that people would get wanderlust and they would move to the West. They would, they would just pack up their wagons and stuff and they'd start heading uh, south along the uh, Shenandoah uh, a valley and into the mountains and, and through the Cumberland uh, Gap and then up in uh, Western Virginia near where, uh, where uh, Cumberland, Maryland is today into the Ohio Valley, valley and so forth. And these were areas where the French had um, had, had uh, fortifications to protect the French's interests, which were primarily in hunting, trapping, uh, this type of stuff. Whereas the British were more involved in tangible things like tobacco and, and uh, sugar and, and um, uh, other more tangible goods that would improve the quality of your life. And so one of the first things that, um, uh, that, uh, uh, that George does is he prohibits the colonists from settling beyond the Appalachian Mountains. In other words, what he wants to do is he wants to, to frame his colonies and control them. And what he has also done, or what his father has done, is they have had upwards of 30,000 soldiers that had to go to North America for this war. And they, they tremendously outnumbered the French, but to garrison those people and to do something with them, they had built tremendous fortifications of empire. Now, to understand this, and this ties very directly to the to the coming of the revolution and why the revolution takes place. So hang in there with me on this. In building these large fortifications, many of you perhaps have been up and have seen the ruins of Crown Point. Uh, you may also be aware of Fort Duquesne and other, other places like this. These are massive fortifications. They're not just fortifications designed for, um, for local area defense against marauding Indians. They're garrison locations. They're places where the king can station seven or eight or 10,000 soldiers. The fortifications are massive with big barracks, lots of areas around them and so forth. They're expensive as hell to build. And of course they were built in 1759 and now the war is over four years later, but those are still assets in the new world. Well. If the colonists start spreading out beyond what the British are willing to defend, then the British are going to be compelled to move farther west and they're going to have to provide additional uh, fortifications. And so to control the cost of the colonies and what they're doing, George III prohibits emigration out of the 13 colonies into the western areas. That doesn't go very well. It's generally ignored. But uh, as the British try to establish this, colonies, they have what are loosely termed as governors. But these governors are emissaries of the crown. They're there basically to keep an eye on the crown's interests and to ensure that anything that Britain needs to know, that the king needs to know about what's going on in, in his colonies they're going to let him know. And so uh, people of some uh, state and status are given these commissions. And uh, the man you're looking at here, uh, Thomas Hutchinson, is one of those men. Now, Hutchinson was a very ambitious man, and he wanted a lot of opportunity that didn't necessarily come his way right away. 
but he did end up in the colonies. He ended up in Massachusetts. And his initial assignment is as Lieutenant Governor in 1760. Well, he wants more than that. And uh, when, uh, when the governor leaves and returns to England, and remember trip to England is a three month proposition. It's about six weeks to come and then six weeks to go back to cross the ocean. Um, Hutchinson becomes the acting governor and a new governor arrives, uh, replacing Hutchinson a few months later. And Hutchinson seeking more authority uh, receives his reward. And that is as the chief justice of the magistrate court in Massachusetts. Hutchinson has no legal basis whatsoever. He's absolutely, totally a neophyte in terms of law and so forth. But he is a good uh, steward of the king's wishes and the governor's wishes. Um, his uh, action in the, um, in the courts are that he looks at the uh, people who are collecting revenues for the king in Massachusetts, and he determines that he needs to do what he can do to help them. And he uh, uh, signs what are called writs of assistance in 1761. And these, these writs are important because uh, what they do is they allow the customs inspectors to basically go anywhere within the colonies and along the docks and so forth of Boston and to investigate um, uh, uh, warehouses and so forth and make sure that everything has duty placed on it. And um, this is very unpopular because what has happened now, the colonies have evolved a tremendous amount in 130 and 140 years, and the wealthy people um, are, are doing extremely well for themselves. And uh, people like John Hancock, but uh, Hancock uh, not only is a very prosperous businessman, but he is a tremendous smuggler. And a lot of people are beating the crown out of a lot of money, uh, carrying on their own commerce and industry in and around Boston. And so these writs of assistance become very, very um, uh, uh, angering to the colonists uh, because they believe that, that the 3,000 mile screwdriver is being exerted on their independent lives. Uh, they believe they, that they're governing themselves. They have their own legislature uh, that is supervised by the governor. And uh, they, have, they have generally taken care of themselves for the better part of 140 years now. And that's, where, that's how they want it to be. Uh, so uh, because Hutchinson is not a legal person, uh, the legal people in the colonies, guys like uh, uh, John Otis and, and, or James Otis and uh, Saint John Adams uh, take great issue with this and, and they're, they're constantly challenging what is going on in the courts. Uh, people become dissatisfied in the colonies and uh, they, they just don't like that this man is interfering. And so by, um, by uh, 1764, uh, 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 the king has assigned a new commander in chief for the uh, United States or for the areas in the states, and that's uh, Thomas Gage. Gage um, is uh, marries an American woman, and uh, he is very, very much uh, in favor of the colonies, but he is also very much a royalist. And you don't go anywhere in Britain uh, if you don't enjoy the favor of the crown and. Uh, Gage may have a soft spot in his heart for America, but he first and foremost is committed to his patron, who is the king, George III. And so as he becomes aware, he is the commander of all British forces in the, uh, in the uh, colonies at that time, of which uh, there had been upwards of 42,000 soldiers throughout North America and in, in the Canadian provinces. Not so much in and around Britain, but spread around the entire area. And the cost of maintaining those was tremendous. So the colonies set forth, or, or the king and his parliament uh, set forth uh, to um, 
uh, to um, I lost my train of thought for a second. The 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 uh, the king and the parliament decide they are going to start creating a whole lot of revenue sources, and those revenue sources in, include various and sundry acts in which they're basically going to collect duty. Things like the Sugar Act and the um, and the Stamp Act are all designed to collect uh, additional revenues off of the activities of the people in the colonies. And the uh, lawyers, the American lawyers, uh, uh, involve themselves not so much with the crown and the governor who is ignoring them, but rather they start talking to each other and they start having uh, meetings in Massachusetts in the various town councils. They start putting together uh, their local governance, which is outside the British governance. And in the 1760s, they begin to develop a very robust set of uh, correspondence, um, uh, the, um, uh, the ability to talk to each other about what's going on and what's coming from the crown and how they're going to resist those things. In 1765, there's enough of an undercurrent in the, uh, in the area that, um, that um, uh, that uh, so, uh, Sons of Liberty and so forth um, assemble and they begin to uh, to riot in the area. And uh, they first uh, they they ransack the home of the Colonial Secretary in Boston, and then they go to Thomas Hutchinson's house uh, twelve days later and they completely sack his house. He leaves the area and. Uh, the uh, the word comes back to England that the colonies are an open rebellion. This is this is in 1765, 66. And so now Gage begins to look for matters in which he can handle this. And he begins to suggest to uh, the king what needs to be done to control the colonies. And so Thomas Gage becomes a very significant factor in the... Um, in the evolving dissatisfaction in the, in, with uh, the crown and how the crown responds to the, uh, to the colonists. And the manner in which the, uh, the colonists handle this uh, is they begin to taunt the British soldiers and more soldiers are sent into Boston itself. And by 1770, uh, there's upwards of 2000 uh, soldiers in Boston. And you've got to do something with them. You've got to quarter them. You've got to put them in places and stuff. You don't have these big forts out there. You do have forts in Boston Harbor and, and so forth. But uh, the people looking at what's going on begin to uh, taunt the, uh, the, 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 the authority, just like you see uh, police today being taunted. The same sort of stuff was happening outside the State House in March of 1770. A group of, um, of um, uh, citizens taunt the man who is on duty and he calls for help and other soldiers fall out and they come forward to assist the man on guard and uh, somebody throws something at the soldiers, soldiers draw and fire on the, on the crowd and, uh, and uh, uh, a group of uh, citizens are killed. Uh, the riots, the rioters uh, overwhelm the, the, the soldiers who who fall back and uh, and a crisis has now been been brought forth in the colonies and uh, the soldiers are charged with murder uh, and the colonists want to see colonial justice. Uh, uh, John Adams draws the uh, the task of defending the British soldiers and just as again as we've seen and you can see parallels. History always repeats itself and you look at how the public responds to things. And in this case, Adams goes, and he's gotta be the most unpopular man in the world because the people want the hide of the British soldiers. And Adams looks at the mitigating factors and he successfully um, argues in defense of the soldiers and the soldiers get off and uh, uh, are, uh, are not convicted and not sent forward. Uh, to uh, suffering imprisonment. And, and um, uh, the response of the crowd is increasing dissatisfaction 
that goes uh, with, with that. Um, the circumstances get more complicated as people become more animated with uh, the frustrations in trying to deal with the British government because government is not dealing with them. And so uh, in uh, 1772, over in uh, Rhode Island, a British ship that is patrolling the harbors trying to stop privateers and, and smugglers from coming in runs aground. Uh, the people, the colonists go forward, they ransack the ship and they burn the ship. Uh, uh, the, um, uh, the, the members who are arrested are charged with uh, treason and under um, current law, uh, they are attempted to be tried in the colonies, but they realize that they're not going to be convicted. And so the trials are set aside and the king is advised that if he is going to do anything, he is going to have to uh, take justice back into his own hands. That people who commit crimes against the crown are not going to be convicted in the colonies. And so if they commit crimes, they need to be brought back. Uh, in 17, back to, to England to stand trial. In 1773, um, uh, a surplus of tea uh, is, is um, uh, put in England and they can't sell it. And uh, rather than have the, uh, the tea company go bankrupt, they decide they're gonna dump it on the colonies and they're gonna tax it extraordinarily heavily. And of course, Hancock is the leading merchant in Boston at the time. And uh, he is so significant that he has his own wharf at Boston, uh, that he has so much trade going on. Um, when you look at this picture of Boston, the thing to notice about it is, as you look at the uh, lower uh, left-hand corner, you see uh, what really basically is a peninsula that leads off Boston is a peninsula. And uh, as you look closer to that, you see the Charles River, uh, you see Boston Harbor to the south, and you see Boston Co Common up to the uh, upper side. It looks, if you look at it carefully, it looks pretty much like a, uh, like a pork chop that has been cut. It's not a big city. And so um, on the 16th of December, uh, the declarations about uh, paying duties on the tea have reached such a point that the citizens won't allow the tea to be unloaded because they don't intend to pay the duties and the duties, the tea is not going to be unloaded into Boston without the duties being paid. So they sit on the ships there. Uh, a crowd of some 5,000 hears some incendiary um, uh, uh, speeches and so forth. And uh, they uh, they send a group of people that run down to the docks or go down to the docks and uh, dressed as Indians, uh, storm aboard the ships and take the tea and toss it into the harbor. Uh, the loss in value is in the millions of dollars. It is, a, it is a huge crime against the crown, which was thinking that this ought to be uh, a, a source of tremendous revenue for them. When the word gets back, uh, that is the last straw as far as the king is concerned. He says that the colonies now are in, in, in total rebellion and he is not going to tolerate that. And so he names uh, Gage uh, to become the, the uh, military governor of Boston. He's going to pull out his civilian governor and he's going to send additional troops in there. And then he is going to uh, uh, have parliament pass a series of acts that are known as the intolerable acts of which the most significant act there is uh, uh, that uh, the Boston Port Act is gonna come in. And the Boston Port Act um, uh, is going to shut the port of Boston to all commerce. If you look at that, to the south of that, you see Boston Harbor, to the north of that, you see the Charles River, everything, and, and, and then at the three o'clock position, or three o'clock position there, those are all wharves, all to deal with folks coming in. If you shut down Boston's uh, commerce from the sea, you kill Boston. 
And that's exactly what they intend to do is to make an example of Boston. When they do that, it puts everybody in Boston out of work. Lord North is now the prime minister of Great Britain and he, with him uh, sits the responsibility of uh, determining how uh, the king's wishes are going to be implemented. George Germain becomes the secretary for the colonies in America. He becomes the king's emissary uh, to handle all things that relate to all aspects of uh, colonial life, both in Canada and in America. And so Germain begins drafting orders, and what he has drafted orders is to emasculate, effectively to emasculate uh, the, uh, the, the, the colonies, uh, and Boston in particular. They're going to make an example of Boston. And uh, in doing this, um, uh, they send instructions to uh, Gage that he should do whatever he can to disarm the the uh, the citizens of Boston and the cop and the different uh, villages surrounding Boston. Well, we earlier talked about the uh, French and Indian War and King Philip's War, the outcropping of those uh, events in which basically. Uh, the various townspeople learn to fend for themselves are that all of these um, towns all have had militias that they have put together for some period of time. They drill regularly, they meet on the greens, on the commons of their towns, and therein becomes the law and order for those towns. And if you go back and carefully read the, the, the Constitution, Declaration of Independence, they're talking about the need for a well-regulated militia. That goes back to these days of 150 years or so of the colonists putting together their own constabulary to protect themselves from Indians, crimes, and everything else that was going on. Um, so what, what uh, Gage is, uh, decides to do is he's going to go and he's going to confiscate the power and arms that have been accumulating in many of these towns. Uh, in late 1774, uh, they engage in an expedition uh, that goes out to a town and they surprise the, the uh, members of the town and they confiscate all the powder that is in the powder magazine and so, so forth and they come back to, to Boston. Uh, in early 1775, Gage becomes a little bolder and makes a determination to go up and do the same thing at Salem, uh, which is northeast of Boston. However, by this point, because all the people in Boston are unemployed, there is nothing the British can do in Boston that doesn't have 20 sets of eyes and, uh, and, and 100 pairs of gossiping lips going on behind it. So whenever they move, whatever they hear in the pubs, uh, or taverns or whatever, all get out to these various towns. So when Gage sends his troops up to Salem, the folks are waiting for him, and they pulled up the bridge. So the British, getting off the boat, can't get across the bridge to get to Salem to confiscate the goods. Uh, because the uh, officer has orders to, uh, to go to the magazine, they come to an agreement that they will lower the bridge, allow the British to come across, they'll go to the magazine, but agree not to go in, and then they return to Boston. Two months later, um, the word is out that, um, that the Continentals have been meeting outside of Boston because they have lost, Boston is closed down to them. And so the Continentals have been meeting primarily in Concord and representatives from around the state or the colony or meeting there. And uh, it is well known that there are uh, large armaments there. There are also, uh, Gage is aware that the colonists have come across and they have found cannon. They have brass cannon and they also have some iron cannons available to them as well. So Gage makes the determination that he is going to march rapidly to Concord and uh, he is going to seize all of the 
uh, uh, arms and so forth, the Concord, and break up the assembly there. The word of that is, uh, gets out rapidly and uh, uh, riders are, um, are dispatched to the various towns to let them know that the British are coming out of Boston. The question is, which way are they going to come? And um, uh, let's see, uh, they're either going to come down the peninsula, which you saw earlier when we looked at the map at, at Boston, or they're going to come across into Cambridge, uh, and then they're going to march the shorter route, one if by land, two if by sea. And uh, as the uh, as the soldiers quietly assemble on Boston Common, uh, they begin to march towards uh, towards uh, the shore where they're going to cross on boats to uh, Lechmere Point, which you see uh, just uh, right to the immediate side there, uh, just to the left of Boston. And from there, they are going to march. Well, in crossing over. There's no docks form there, and the 700 or so soldiers, a combination of light infantry and grenadiers, uh, which are heavy infantry, uh, find themselves tied up in the marshes in that area. And so what is supposed to be a march that would put them into Concord before dawn uh, gets slowed tremendously. Uh, Paul Revere and other riders get out in front of them and, and begin warning people as to what is going on. As they do, uh, uh, the militia in Lexington uh, call, are called out and they fall, fall in. And uh, what the folks, what the British are aware of are that um, both Adams and uh, um, Hancock are rather careless. And uh, the uh, the colonists believe that the British may actually be coming to break up the assembly and perhaps take Hancock, who is the president of the assembly, and Adams, who is one of the leading advocates there. And so when, Han when uh, Revere arrives in, in Lexington, it so happens that uh, Hancock and, and uh, Adams are having dinner, and uh, they are run off uh, because the, the British are coming. But the militia sitting out on the green, there's no British in sight because British are about four hours behind schedule. And so uh, William Parker uh, puts together the uh, militia and he releases them uh, to go home to be ready on notice to come back and fall back in again. And many of them just retire across the street to the building you see to the left front there, Buckman Tavern where they will sit and wait for much of the night. Um, uh, the town meeting house is what you see directly in front of you. And then you see the cupola, which had been moved uh, down from a hill and was just sitting waiting to be reinstalled that are on the green. Uh, Parker sends people forward and eventually they run into uh, the British. In the meantime, uh, scouts that uh, the British have sent out to secure the roads capture Paul Revere, they capture uh, William Dawes and, and others who have made uh, the ride and are out notifying people. And just after uh, five o'clock in the morning, the word comes that the British are actually arriving. And because they don't have daylight savings time there, the, um, uh, the, uh, the light is up and, it's, and the morning is, is breaking for them. Somewhere around 5.30, the light infantry come forward and they dispatch on either side of the meeting house going around to the left between Buckman Tavern and the meeting house. And then the grenadiers come to the field to the right side. The, um, uh, the, the militia stand about two to 300 yards from the spot where the British come onto the green and nobody knows who fires the first shot, but uh, a shot is fired, and the British, in disciplined order, uh, fire a volley, which takes down several of the uh, colonists. And then the colonists are routed off the field by a bayonet charge and, and fall back off the green. The, the British then gather themselves back together again and begin the march to 
um, uh, begin the march over to Concord. By nine o'clock in the morning, uh, the uh, the British or the, the colonists are well aware and nearly a thousand militia have now assembled uh, on the high ground in the distance in this, in this photo. And the word comes that the British are in fact arriving. And about nine o'clock in the morning, they arrive. The first thing the British do is they secure the town and they send approximately seven companies out across the North Bridge, this bridge where they're observed. Four of them will go on to, um, uh, to uh, a house where they believe the, the, uh, the, uh, the colonial stores are hidden and three companies will defend this bridge. Two um, on the far side and one company on the near side in front of you. And uh, as that um, uh, takes place, uh, the British who are in town who have set up headquarters at Wright Tavern are looking at various things and, and they are starting to burn some stuff, but not the town. Uh, the militia watching from a distance have orders not to fire. I don't think they know that firing and blood has been shed at Lexington. And they just observe and the four companies go on past them, but they see fire in the town and that, in, that incites them and they, they cry out, are we gonna let them burn our town boys? And, and the answer is no, we're not going to do that. And so the militia begin moving down uh, off the hills and they make the uh, two companies on the far side get very nervous. They fall back over the bridge and begin to take up some of the runners of the cross planks and stuff on the bridge. But the, uh, the, but the, the militia pulled across and uh, firing uh, takes place. The uh, militia come across the bridge. Uh, some British are killed. Uh, one British soldier is tomahawked in the head and his brain spilt out. You see a, a monument to him right at the foot of the, of the uh, bridge there, right in, in the lower center. And uh, the, um, the colonists uh, come across and then they line up on a stone wall that if you came toward us over my shoulder behind where the photo was taken from, there's a, there's a stone wall there and they set up position there. The British come take a look at that and decide they don't want any part of that. Uh, the uh, other four companies come back and are allowed to return unmolested and they go back into the town. And at noon, the orders go out for uh, a general retreat to start. So as the retreat starts, I'm not going to go into a great deal of detail with this, but what's important is you look at this map and we will spend a lot of time, in fact, on the program, we are going to walk the entire distance from Merriam's Corner to Fisk Hill uh, on Sunday afternoon. That's about six miles. And uh, we've done it before. It's a great walk, and there's a lot of stories to tell there. But what's significant about this is that uh, the militia are coming from all around Massachusetts, uh, and they are all now beginning to get to the point on the high ground. And there are choke points along this road in which the flankers that the British have sent out, the light infantry to control the high ground, has to fall back and join uh, the main force to cross rivers and streams and bridges and so forth. And when that happens, those places uh, like near the Brooks House and, and um, uh, Bloody Angle and so forth, they become places of ambush that the militia can open fire on the folks. And the farther the British come back, uh, the more they're being pursued behind them and the more other uh, militia come and collapse on them on either side. Uh, by the time they get to Fisk Hill, they have run into the reconstituted Lexington militia uh, under uh, uh, Captain Parker and their uh, Parker's men return the... Uh, the bloody favor that they had received before six o'clock that same morning. Uh, the British are basically shattered until they come uh, into Lexington. And lo and behold, when they arrive in Lexington uh, around two o'clock, 
they, um, there you go. So when they get to Lexington, re reinforcements have been sent from Boston. They are, they are some distance behind, but they are set up uh, in Lexington. And uh, when, uh, when uh, Colonel Smith's initial force gets to Lexington, they now are covered by the, uh, by the support force and the entire force then begins to fall back and their next big confrontation takes place in Monotomy. There you go. When, um, when the British get into Monotomy, by this point, there are several thousand militia that have come forward and the British are at their fullest strength. They're over a thousand as well. In this house is the bloodiest site in the entire day of the battle road. And that, um, uh, I believe 11 to 13 people are killed inside that house. When, when we go in there, you'll still see there are hatchet marks and bullet holes. And indeed, Jason uh, Russell, the owner of the house, who's in his 70s, dies right there on the front step where he is uh, bayoneted uh, on the doorstep of his house. The British make their way out of, um, out of monotomy, uh, having suffered uh tremendously as they come back they find that the that the colonists have blocked their way to cross back over uh the Charles River to get back into Boston and so uh they make a determination and they they deviate and they move over towards Cambridge and they uh find high ground at a hill known as Bunker Hill and there they end their day uh uh, just as dark uh, falls. Uh, the day has produced over a hundred, a hundred deaths and several hundred casualties. The British have bled more. They've lost 65, 70 men, uh, comes off the top of my head. Uh, the, the, um, the colonists have lost significantly as well. Many of them to bayonet uh, deaths and wounds, uh, such as like you saw at the, the Jason Russell house. But uh, with the arrival there, um, the events of the 19th have ended, but the war has in fact started. Uh, I was going to uh, talk about, um, uh, um, about the Declaration of Independence, some of the things in there a little bit. And if I have a, a minute or two at the end, I may make a, a parenthetical comment to end. But I do apologize to you all. This was a little harder for me. All I've been doing is is looking at a screen of my own pictures and so forth. And, and that's hard to keep a good presentation going with that. But uh, with that, I'll, I'll open it up if anybody has any questions and, uh, and then I will wrap up. I can take about five or 10 minutes of questions. Uh, yes, Wayne Snodgrass. Um, you mentioned a couple of times during your presentation, which I thought was excellent. Thank you very much. Um, the parallels of today's environment. Can you yeah. elaborate more on that? What other events happening today that you see are more in parallel with what happened back then? Well, I think um, uh, the one, the, the, the most um, uh, uh, striking uh, uh, comparison is uh, the, the behavior of, of the crowds, the, whether you want to call them mobs, protesters, whatever you want to have. In Boston, you had a, 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 a lot of people were protesting the policies of the government, a, a, a pol set of policies that they didn't have a whole lot of say in, and they believed, uh, indeed, the Declaration of Independence, as it is written, talks a lot about the insensitivity of the government towards the needs of the people and how they are living there and so forth. And many times, they felt that the only manner in which they could handle this would be a response to violence, uh, whether it was tarring and feathering people, whether it was um, riding them out of town on a rail, uh, um, whether it was hanging people in effigy. Uh, all of those types of protests uh, were, were significant. And when you looked at that, um, Thomas Jefferson even wrote uh, many several hundred years ago, he said, the, the tree of liberty must be watered with the blood of tyrants and patriots every so often. 
to, to, to maintain itself. What you're seeing a lot today is you are seeing uh, people who are uh, uh, perceive themselves to be oppressed, uh, that, that the government is not fair to them and is not responsive to them, and they, they are believing that their source of, of, um, of protest uh, is to take to the streets and to uh, trash, just as you saw, for example, um, Hutchinson's house and the, uh, uh, some of the other British officials' houses were destroyed completely in 1765. You also see uh, public buildings being uh, torched and so forth. Uh, the other thing I, I um, uh, uh, see with this is uh, that you uh, have a, uh, a problem with uh, respect for authority, uh, that the people who are there to, uh, to maintain discipline, uh, be they militia, and in this case, what we talk about are the British soldiers who become the constabulary of Boston as Boston goes under, under um, uh, uh, martial law, effectively, under, with uh, Thomas Gage uh, handling that. And then you also see uh, out in the various and sundry towns where they are uh, under the control of the militia, people of the town themselves. And you see that translated today, the National Guard is probably the most analogous uh, to Minutemen, people who are called in and, and mustered in the militia. And then you also have uh, the local town constabulary are the police departments and so forth and how they deal with problems and difficulties and so forth. I think that is the, that's the comparison. There are other comparisons, but those are the two that uh, strike me as most obvious. You guys must take this I, finishing I, at nine o'clock seriously. Liam, yeah, go ahead. Uh, here's, here's a question. Okay, so real quick, um, casualties on, in Lexington, casualties in Concord. And I guess casualties for Concord, for casualties for the action, and then all the retreat. Uh, Gary, I'm not a I'm not a numbers guy and didn't put it in front of me, but uh, okay. in a rough in a rough um, handling is what you have is you have one engagement basically. You have uh, 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 the um, uh, the the uh, militia on Lexington Green facing the regular troops. And there is a volley, and then there is free firing uh, until um, uh, a, a major pit kern of the of the Royal Marines gets a handle on the soldiers and brings them back into line. They rout the uh, uh, the, uh, the the militia with their bayonet, run them off the green. Um, there are a handful dead. I want to say there are six or seven uh, that are killed. Six of them, I think, are have been reburied on the, on the green under a monument there. In uh, Concord, very, very few casualties in Concord, just the, um, the uh, short engagement at, at, the, uh, at the North Bridge, um, where all the casualties take place are in the uh, five or six spots in which uh, the British flankers have to fall back in and the militia who have come from the surrounding times fall in and get into positions of ambuscade where they can get a volley or two off of the um, of the um, uh, uh, at the soldiers who are passing over a bridge or or through a choke point or a hard turn in the road where they they don't have a whole lot of cover and the and the and the uh, uh, the militia are firing from the woods or from high ground or from behind a fence where the majority of the casualties on this day take place, the, clearly the bloodiest part of the day is in Monotomy. Uh, there are large numbers of troops on both sides, both coming into town. Uh, the the, the uh, colonists are well positioned uh, in all the different buildings and stuff, and the British go into the buildings to root these people out. I pointed out Jason Russell House because it is the bloodiest of the of the spots with some 13 dead, I believe is, was the body count in there. But there's lots of, of, of death and destruction taking place on the green and throughout the streets of the town as the soldiers continue to pursue their way forward. After they get out of monotomy, 
uh, the, the core of the killing is basically finished for the day. The British will make their way to the high ground uh, where they'll be supported by artillery and the militia will not follow them onto Bunker Hill. Okay. Well, can I ask a follow-up question real quick? Sure. Uh, um, so was the, at the time, okay, of course we look back in retrospect, but at the time, did everybody assume right after Lexington or right when the British army got back from Concord to Boston that, that there was in fact a war on, or was there any little cooling down period? It, you know, no, no. Fifteen within within uh, a few weeks, there were fifteen thousand militia in and around Cambridge, Cambridge uh, uh, Green, across uh, the British. Uh, brought other thousands of soldiers in, and and uh, the British, uh, when they evacuate in uh, in January in uh, March of seventeen seventy five. Uh, they leave with approximately 11,000 soldiers and 1,000 loyalists who don't believe they can stay in Boston, which is a town of about uh, 5,000 uh, patriots and about 1,000 loyalists. They don't believe they can stay anymore. And, of course, the uh, militia organized under Israel Putnam and the Continental Congress makes a determination that they need somebody of military experience to organize. And so... Uh, shortly before, or shortly after uh, the June Battle of uh, Bunker Breeds Hill, George Washington comes and assumes command of the uh, Continentals and begins to organize them. Thanks. Any any other questions, folks? Okay. Uh, in finishing up, I want to thank you all for your patience with me. Again, um, uh, I, I give talks, but it's very rare that I ever talk to a to an iPad screen of which all I see are a couple of buttons and slides. And so it can be disconcerting and, and I apologize for, for stumbling and running a little longer than I intended to. What I do want to do is give you some homework going away from this though. And, and I want to give you something to think about as I hope the talk has given you things to think about. The, the necessity, uh, uh, I was asked a question a few moments ago about about comparisons then and now. And clearly the, the source of discontent was the cost of maintaining the colonies. The fact that the British government had a crushing, crushing debt that they had no means of paying at all. Sound familiar? We owe $30 trillion now. Uh, and we've got to find a way to get some money. And so too did George III. And the only place he could go because he had already tapped out the wealthy who were all dukes and earls and noblemen and so forth is he had to go to the people. He had to go to the folks who were working hard scrabble livings and he had to tap their businesses and everything else to bring stuff in. That's not a political statement. That's just a comparison of what you see happens because what I think brought us to the American Revolution was that the Americans had lived independently for 150 years. And all of a sudden, somebody came in and started not only to tell them how to live, but then reached into their pockets and took away their livelihoods. Guys like Hancock and those people. Hancock was filthy rich, but he was the biggest smuggler in America. George Washington was a land baron uh, in Ohio. He owned thousands and thousands of acres and hundreds of slaves. These were wealthy people and they didn't cotton to too much to people um, using them and using their resources to get out of their problem. And the question as to whether or not the colonists should have shared in their defense or not, I honestly think looking at it over the years, they should have. And, and there had to be a solution to that. Uh, for 12 or 13 years, George sought, thought, sought those solutions and in each instance was rejected. And uh, ultimately, it took an event like this to light the fire from which there was no turning back. And uh, the, 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 um, uh, the flame was inevitable. The homework for you guys, and this is what I was going to finish up with, and I ran about 20 minutes longer 
than I intended to in my own remarks is go back and look at the Declaration of Independence tonight for, for this reason and this reason alone. To appreciate the Declaration is to read the causes, the 27 causes that were enumerated as to why we needed to separate from Britain. Read each one individually and read each in context. And then think about what I said to you tonight, going back to King Philip's War and the French and Indian War and all the other things that came forward with this. And look at that and ask yourself, was this not the declaration of people who believed that they could take care of themselves and certainly weren't interested in taking care of somebody in another in another country. And so uh, when you reread that, it has a different perspective because in 1775, the people who founded uh, the country, the, 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 um, the Continental Congress, were very, very deliberate in the experience of America for the past 155 years and what they had experienced, what worked for them, what didn't work for them, what was fair and what was unfair. Self-governance, self-regulation, self-taxes. We hold these truths to be self-evident. All men are created equal in their God-given rights. When you look at all that, you see the difference between the new world and the old world, which was a, a world of monarchies and intermarriage and inherited wealth. And then you had a country of entrepreneurs who could be as wealthy as they and their businesses could generate wealth. And so it's a very fascinating study. We'll have a couple of full days for those of you who may join me in uh, October. Um, and I can go into a lot of these things in much more detail. In addition, we'll spend a lot more time actually looking at the uh, military operation that was Lexington and Concord. So with that, I'd like to thank all of you for joining me tonight. Karen, thanks for your support. And um, uh, I hope if any of you have any questions for me, send me an email. I'll try to answer them. And uh, if you're interested in joining us, I sure hope you will. It's going to be a good time. Thank you all and good night.